This is Tornado Talk, a weekly podcast about one of nature's most fascinating phenomena. Share your tornado story online by email or call us toll free 800-439-1570. That's 800-439-1570. Now, meteorologist Jennifer Naramore and Dan Holiday, Tornado Talk is on. He is one of the most popular figures on cable television. During tornado season, his appearance on the Weather Channel often signals that severe weather is underway somewhere in the country. We've given a torque on today, the first time in the history of the Tornado Condition Index of a 10 uh, for northern parts of Alabama. It's pretty much guaranteed there's going to be a tornado within 50 miles of you if you're in the northern half of the state. He's the severe weather expert, and we wanted to know more about him. Dr. Greg Forbes was born near Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He always wanted to be a scientist, earned a degree in meteorology at Penn State University, but later had the opportunity to work with one of the world's best, Dr. Ted Fujita at the University of Chicago. Uh, this is Greg Forbes, my student, and I flew over to take picture of the whole area. And uh, this is one of the pictures which shows that I think it's a green elevator up here. Uh, Could you tell me how big is this and how it happened? We've received your email questions for Dr. Forbes, and he answers what you wanted to know about severe weather and tornadoes. Plus, we learn more about Dr. Forbes on a personal level. What mischief did he get into as a child? What does he do in his spare time? What are his favorite snacks? And what would he be doing now if he wasn't doing weather? This is Tornado Talk. Up close and personal with a severe weather expert at the Weather Channel, Dr. Greg Forbes. We wanted to know how long ago the weather bug bit Greg Forbes. He told us it goes all the way back to junior high. When I got start interested in meteorology as uh, as a student, I was in the seventh grade, and, and the uh, teacher taught a module on meteorology. Uh, I had sort of known at that point that I wanted to be a scientist, but I didn't really know that meteorology was a pure science you know you could watch television and it seems like they had clowns and everybody else that were just doing the weather so it didn't seem too serious but we drew maps from uh, from weather data and looked at clouds and so on and and then watching one of the tv meteorologists joe donardo on on the pittsburgh channel uh he seemed pretty professional so i realized then that meteorology was a true science and so uh, Based upon the weather forecast, if it was we lived out in the country, so if it was going to be a sunny day, my mother, after washing clothes, would hang them out on lines to dry instead of using the dryer. And so I realized that accurate weather forecasts could really impact people's lives. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to be a meteorologist and do that. And then once I got to Penn State uh, and started studying meteorology, we started... Uh, learning about the work that Dr. Fujita was doing, not just with the Fujita scale, but he was doing all sorts of, or had done all sorts of exciting things about severe thunderstorms and and weather patterns and and analyzing uh, weather data to to better understand and predict these. And so I thought, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to go and study with Dr. Fujita and be a severe weather forecaster. So it started in seventh grade, and then the severe weather aspect of it came on while I was an undergraduate. It's often said when opportunity meets preparation, you find success. Such is the case with Dr. Forbes. What led him to where he is today? Most of everything I uh, came to be sort of came about in three ways. One, from from all the wonderful professors I had at Penn State that taught me most of what I know about weather forecasting. And then um, the study studies and the time with Dr. Vida taught me most of what I know about severe weather in terms of storm structure and, and uh, looking at radar. And then uh, my own experience in, in studying... Uh, and looking at journals and attending conferences after I got my PhD keeps me current in terms of uh, all the research and you know the state of the science that's that's going on. So it's threefold. Uh, I, there's you know that's, but there's a lot of luck that goes involved in a career. Also, the uh, I got very lucky. Dr. Vegeta didn't have very many students, and uh, in order to have students. He uh, needed to have financial support. I wouldn't have been able 
to afford to go to graduate school. I don't, would have had to have had a, taken a job, uh, but I was able to get a, a graduate financial assistantship from Dr. Fujita. But he didn't really have any when I first applied to him, and he said, well, he was, might be getting some money coming in. And so I held off. I had I was accepted to three graduate schools. Two of them had already offered me assistantships, and I was holding out, waiting for Dr. Fujita. One of them I had to... You know, one of them then had to say, I, you know, they couldn't wait any longer. Uh, and uh, finally, Dr. Vegeta said he had the money. So I was very lucky in that regard. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, while I was at the University of Chicago, I had gotten my, ba- uh, my master's degree, uh, but he was running out of money again. And I, I might have. I was literally on the day of the 1974 super outbreak. I was being interviewed for a position with the National Center for Atmospheric Research to go fly an aircraft uh, in a project called Gate. They were looking at the genesis of Atlantic tropical cyclones from disturbances coming off of Africa. So I would have been flying around in an aircraft at low altitude in these storms coming off of Africa. So. Uh, but for the super outbreak, 74, I would probably have wound up being a hurricane expert instead of a severe weather expert for a profession. Uh, with that super outbreak, Dr. Fujita pulled me aside and said, uh, well, you might want to hold off if if you can hang on. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get some more money, uh, research funds coming out of this super outbreak. And indeed, that wound up being the case. And so I was able to stay and get my Ph.D. studying the super outbreak tornadoes. Uh, from uh, from uh, using radar and using video of a tornado that had multiple vortices, suction vortices, and and measuring some of those. So a lot of luck there in in a couple of ways, and and luck in the sense that uh, I was lucky to get a faculty position at Penn State. I had t- called or written to one of my former professors, John Kerr, and. Uh, ask if he'd write me a rec- letter of recommendation to another university, and he said, well, sure, but we actually have a temporary opening here. Why don't you apply for that? And so I was able to get on initially at Penn State and then wound up getting into a tenure-track position and wound up being there for 21 years. And uh, But at that point, I was starting to get more and more away from severe weather f- forecasting or anything forecasting i was teaching all the time and and even teaching classes on statistics and computer applications and meteorology and and so uh, i was sort of getting uh, a little frustrated and the weather channel came along and said well we're expanding uh, our expert team to include a severe weather expert would you be interested in applying for that and i said well yes and so as it wound up, uh, I, I was able to get that uh, position. And so to, to get where I've gotten, it's taken a lot of diligence and a lot of hard work and on my part, but there's always in, in people's careers, there's a lot of luck. You have to be in the right place in the right time and be in a position to take the opportunities when, when they come your way. Now, in terms of the question about the University of Chicago and my experiences with Dr. Fujita, boy, that's a that's a long topic. Uh, I mean, from an excitement standpoint, on one level, I got to fly around in Cessna aircraft hundreds and hundreds of hours looking at tornado damage, uh, and so that's just an eye-opening experience. The the structure of tornado damage patterns that you can see from the air is is just tremendous. You don't get that kind of perspective on the ground. Uh, and then uh, part of the financial support was from NESDIS, the satellite folks. Uh, they had just, be, well, the, the geostationary satellites that we take for granted now were just in their infancy stage while I was a graduate student. And, um, and so... They wanted to really know, could you look at the overshooting top behavior, the up and down behavior of the thunderstorm tops, did that relate it at all to severe weather and tornadoes? So we would fly around in Learjets just a little bit behind the line of storms, 
at that time it wasn't a video camera it was a uh, it was a movie projector and uh, the shot at high speeds and then taking time lapse video of these time lapse movies actually of these overshooting tops and then we would take them back to the lab and uh, use uh, photogrammetry to measure the the up and down mo- motion of those those cloud tops. So that was extremely interesting. I always kid people. Well, you never know. The Rolling Stones might have been in this Learjet the day before we flew in it. It was they were just aircraft or leased. They uh, they made some small modifications to the aircraft to for to enable us to be photographing out the windows at at such high altitudes. So. But that was extremely exciting, and then every day when Dr. Fujita would go home and work and make make drawings, conceptual models, and and other research that he would do at night, every morning he would come in and yell down the hallway for me to come and interact with him on, on what he had done. I'm coming here as a scientist, you know, because we do research on tornadoes. And uh, the main reason why we are here is to find out what tornado did. And in case of future tornadoes, you know, what people should do, that's the kind of thing we want to find out. Yeah, I would sometimes be out doing the damage surveys with him, so all of those were just priceless moments. I was there for, uh, you know, basically the confirmation of suction vortices. I was uh, there for the discovery while it, while he made the discovery of microbursts we had been part of the discovery of downbursts in our damage surveys and relating that to radar and uh and uh and i was the field manager for the first field project to study microbursts missed in the summer of 1978 uh, and so uh it was extremely exciting times i could just go on forever about uh, you know, as memories came back to mind about, you know, it was just so exciting. I, I had originally gone to the University of Chicago intending to get a master's degree and then go off and be a severe weather forecaster at what now is called the Storm Prediction Center. But it was way too exciting what I was doing and, what you know, when Dr. Fujita said you should stay for your Ph.D., you do that. And so that got me off into research and academia I thought, well, basically at that time, a Ph.D., I would have been overqualified for the Storm Prediction Center. But later, uh, you know, as the, that Ph.D. came to came to my benefit when uh, in putting me in the expert position for the, for the severe weather expert at the Weather Channel. Dr. Ted Fujita made an impact not only on Dr. Forbes, but science in general. It was 45 years ago that he created the damage scale for tornadoes. Yeah, Dr. Fujita came up with the Fujita scale in uh, 1971. Uh, that was before I started at the University of Chicago. I started there in the fall of 72. So, uh, uh, a lot of the early testing of uh, Fujita scale uh, in terms of doing some of the damage surveys and using the Fujita scale, I was, was, was part of that. More than 35 years later, the damage scale for tornadoes would be enhanced. Dr. Forbes said it had been in the works for quite a while. Starting in 1974, that super outbreak with the destruction to schools in a number of places uh, got the engineering community much more involved in uh, tornadoes than they had been in the past. And so uh, they started looking at the wind speeds that Dr. Fujita had proposed for the original Fujita scale, that one that was developed in 1971. He, He came up with those wind speeds without a whole lot of scientific basis for it. There wasn't very much in the way of engineering studies to say really what kind of wind speeds and what kind of wind forces would do various kinds of damage. And so uh, he used whatever little bits were there, plus kind of his intuition. But uh, the engineers pretty quickly began to say, once they got more heavily involved, that, hey, these wind speeds, you know, the total destruction of a house and breaking it to bits, F5, 261 to 318 miles per hour, it doesn't take anywhere near those kind of wind speeds to totally disintegrate a house. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so they started proposing, e, you know, EF, what now are the EF5 wind speeds that were more like 200 to 220 miles per hour for the, 
for the top wind speeds needed to damage most of the kind of structures that uh, typically are seen. There's only a few very heavily engineered structures that would withstand the higher wind speeds than that. Of course, high rises, the building will withstand that, but the windows and everything else will break and it'll just destroy kind of the insides of the buildings. But uh, so after, you know, after several decades, three decades, I guess, of, um, of their influence, including a, a lot of the influence that sort of brought the research, well, sorry, brought the engineering community into the meteorological community, Tim Marshall, having both a degree in engineering and meteorology, and attending both kind of uh, seminars and conferences, uh, you know, and publishing some papers and things like that, be- he uh, sort of began to infiltrate engineering information into the meteorological community. And so uh, I was part of a team then uh, that, uh, inc- and as was Tim Marshall, there were three meteorologists and three engineers uh, that. Came, met together and went through painstakingly type of structure by type of structure and what did we really think uh, winds were needed to cause that kind of damage. And so uh, that consensus then was became the basis, still albeit somewhat subjective, but uh, better tuned to what we now call the enhanced Vegeta scale. And there are very much more detailed on a structure by structure basis guidelines for what wind speeds are needed the the details were very sparse for the original Fujita scale uh, and it was not very specific by different types of structures uh, and so things are a lot more uh, specified now than they were in the original Fujita scale but they're probably still not not per- perfect and there still are a lot of different kinds of structures that really uh, are not covered in, in those guidelines. The, the damage descriptors, the set of those is, is not comprehensive. So there's, you know, some things that that happen out there that, you know, like bridges uh, collapse or things like that, or even cars, vehicles, it's very difficult because of the different types of vehicles and, and uh, their orientation to the wind may be unknown and so on it, that it, they're very difficult to assess uh, wind speeds by, by virtue of damage to them. Recently, some meteorologists have expressed interest in seeing mobile Doppler radar winds used in tornado damage surveys. Would Dr. Forbes like to see them incorporated? Well, I think ultimately uh, the mobile Doppler radar winds could become used and, and should become used uh, but the problem is at the moment that, for the most part, they're measuring winds uh, that are often uh, some uh, above the ordinary home altitude. And, and frankly, most of the damage that is caused by tornadoes is by relatively low buildings, homes, and occasionally, uh, you know, business buildings in a, a much lesser extent. Uh, any any tall buildings get involved. So the the the, the enhanced Vegeta scale is really designed to be at about the ten foot level. You know the the rooftop level or the near the top of the first floor. Whereas most of the mobile Doppler radar winds, uh, since the beam has to tilt up a little bit in order to avoid blocking by trees and, and getting things and, and other structures in the way, uh, things we call ground clutter, uh, most of the time they're measuring at somewhere the 30 to 50 feet range above ground as their lowest altitude. And the problem is then the because the friction becomes so much more as you get down toward the ground, there's a very nonlinear relationship between uh, winds at uh, you know, 50 feet and what they might be at the 10 feet level, but it probably varies from occasion to occasion. We don't know exactly the the right algorithm for translating a 50 foot measured wind to what it would be at 10 foot level. 
uh, because of that frictional effect and how it varies with stability and, and roughness of the, of the particular area that uh, the winds would be in. And then also, it seems as if, from what we can see, that some tornadoes, the, the fastest winds might be 100 feet, and other tornadoes, the fastest winds might be down at 10 feet. So that combination of tornado variability and an unknown transform from the, the radar measured altitude down to the 10-foot altitude is, uh, is a problem. We've been receiving questions for Dr. Greg Forbes at TornadoTalk.com. And this question comes from Alan Kane. Alan wanted to know what his most unusual tornado outbreak was. Wow. Well, that, yeah, that is an interesting question, a, a, a different kind of question. Certainly the, the worst outbreak that I've covered, uh, there have been two super outbreaks, one that I covered in the, in the damage survey mode, the 1974 super outbreak. The National Weather Service says it has sighted a tornado near the greater Cincinnati airport. Here is the National Weather Service with the latest report. It is a foul cloud. It looks to be about 200 feet off. No, now it is touching the ground. What is it doing now? Heading directly toward Hamilton County. Southwest of the city now. It's going to go up the west side of the city and through the northwest side of the city. And one that I covered on air as a as a severe weather expert at the Weather Channel, the. 2011 super outbreak. We have tornado emergencies for some of the other areas. There's been a large tornado reported heading toward the Tuscaloosa area, a wedge tornado. It's near Mantua. Should be within 10 to 15 miles now of the Tuscaloosa area. There have been outbreaks. I, I covered the, the tornado outbreak, the multi-day outbreak from, from Hurricane Ivan. Uh, that's certainly a, a, the, the tornado outbreaks associated with hurricanes certainly uh, very different beasts in in many cases than to those from uh, more traditional spring severe weather outbreaks. And there's been some cases that have been cold core, where the tornadoes are, are low topped or associated with low top thunderstorms and cold air aloft. Uh, so that uh, there's been a whole whole range of types of of uh, Tornadoes, and then some that uh, some that are under the cold air coming into the west coast uh, in in some of the the winter storms. So I've covered a whole lot of different situations, but coming up with one that's the most unusual probably. Uh, little bit of a challenge right off the top of my head here. When your career in meteorology spans decades, you've no doubt seen many severe weather events. There are some that stick in your mind as the biggest. Dr. Forbes says in addition to the 2011 Dixie Alley outbreak he covered on television, there have been several others. Well, I think those two super outbreaks had uh, probably the most impact or, or the most memorable events in my career, but there's been some others. The 1985 tornado outbreak in the Pennsylvania, Ohio area, I was uh, at Penn State at the time, and we had a radar there. I was following, it wasn't Doppler, but there were big supercells and hook echoes that you just don't see hardly ever in Pennsylvania that I was following. There were some other outbreaks in uh, in the 90s, smaller ones in Pennsylvania that I followed, and I did some damage surveys of those uh, tornadoes on, on those occasions as well. So that was very interesting, looking at tornadoes and their pass across rugged terrain of Pennsylvania. The mountains aren't big, but the transition from valley to mountaintop is, is pretty sharp in some of those. So that was, that was very interesting. Uh, of course, there's been a number of other notable tornadoes that that we covered the uh, Mike Bettis was out in the field in 2009 and I was uh, in the studio and we were jointly uh, narrating his observations and it was the first of the tornadoes that was captured and documented by the Vortex 2 research project that was in Wyoming in June 2009 and then uh, the following year, I was out, went out chasing uh, tornadoes with, along with Mike Bettis 
and uh, we came across a fairly sizable tornado in Oklahoma on May 10th. And then uh, subsequent years, let me think, 2013, I suppose, got a tornado real close to us, and it was roped out, so it was kind of, the rope part was kind of right over top of us. And then another tornado formed, uh, and these were land spot type tornadoes, uh, another tornado formed real close to us, so that was real exciting. A couple of days later came the Moore, Oklahoma tornado. You know, we didn't see that tornado in progress, but we certainly saw the uh, the damage that it had done and and uh, covered that from the field. So that was that was exciting. The the El Reno tornado, I was that Mike Bettis got caught in. I was was in the studio for that one, and that was pretty scary time and we suddenly realized that uh, the tornado had probably gone right over his location and we started to to really really worry Uh, i went over to the video acquisition center that would be in communication with him and i asked have we heard from mike uh are they all okay And, and finally the the word came in that they had been hit but but they all survived. The El Reno, Oklahoma tornado has been one of the most studied tornadoes ever. Harrison Sincavage wanted to ask if the tornado that occurred on May 31st, 2013 needs new nomenclature. Reason being is that those vortices were the size of regular tornadoes, identical in size to what occurred in May of this year near Dodge City, Kansas. Achieving a vortex breakdown is a complicated process, but when it occurred within those multi-vortex tornadoes, the sub-vortices were very large. Large. Yeah, that's a very good point, uh, and I described it uh, on air, and I think uh, some of the researchers have uh, basically said this in publications since then, that the, the so-called El Reno tornado was really the, the mesocyclone on the ground, uh, the mesocyclone being the, the whole rotating wall cloud portion or the whole rotating updraft portion of the supercell thunderstorm that uh, got so intense that it was essentially not confined to cloud base and above, but it was worked its way right down to the ground. And so I think some of these huge tornadoes are, you know, backing, I'll backtrack for a second, we like to make concise uh, categorization of things. Well, you've got the tornado, you've got the section vortices, you've got the mesocyclone, etc., but... Uh, there are always in the in the real atmosphere. There are not always these very distinct distinctions. Instead, there are uh, you know continual transitions from one to the other. And I think sometimes big wide tornadoes are uh, sometimes these mesocyclones that are down to the ground. I think the El Reno case was probably the extreme example that we've had of that thus far. So that. In that sense, the mesocyclone, too, can break down, and there's been previous examples of that proposed and or published or theorized, at least in the the literature, that uh, mesocyclones can have more than one tornado revolving about them. And uh, so that could have been the case in the El Reno situation, that maybe those were tornadoes revolving about that parent mesocyclone rather than section vortices revolving around a great big tornado. So the, from what I saw of the of Mike Bettis video, uh, as they were racing away from just trying to get away from the tornado, those were, I, I definitely would have called those, they were small enough, I would have definitely called those suction vortices within a, a big tornado. While Dr. Greg Forbes was not in the field observing the El Reno twister, he did encounter the damage from the 2013 Moore, Oklahoma tornado that hit the Briarwood Elementary School. We wanted to know what led to upgrading it from a high-end EF4 to an EF5. There had been a, a big water tank that had landed in the midst of the residential area right there near the elementary school and uh, where we were broadcasting from. And I had gone and asked the residents, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't look right. This this big thing, surely this wasn't just right in the middle. And they said, no, it came, it came in during the tornado. So it had been some big water tank from a farm about a half mile away that had landed, gone, flown through the air and landed in this residential area that had been so heavily destroyed. 
Uh, as it turns out, there was a second one that landed on the school. We hadn't seen it. We couldn't see it from our vantage point, but it had landed on the school and I guess went down through the roof. To me, that's out of the ordinary. That's extraordinary, and probably this ought to be an EF-5. And then they went on to find a couple of structure locations that also technically by the EF descriptor standards met the the five criteria. Severe weather outbreaks can lead to long days and nights on the air. Dr. Forbes told us what keeps him going behind the scenes when storms don't slow down. What really keeps me going through the event is uh, that I'm a big fan of Diet Coke with Splenda uh, as a sweetener, and I sort of alternate that with... uh, caffeine-free diet Dr. Pepper so that I don't get too too much caffeine in my system. Uh, so I, you know, my, my sodas and, and uh, you know, ice cream uh, uh, are sort of my, the things that I'm, <laughs> I'm best known for. And with that, we decided to learn more. What are some of the things we've always wanted to ask but never knew about Dr. Forbes? He's sometimes referred to as Storm Master G at the Weather Channel, but in school, kids gave him a different name. Yeah, I I had uh, a bunch of nicknames. Uh, In first grade, you know, sometimes the kids weren't, uh, you know, didn't have great pronunciations or might have had trouble pronouncing things, so... Gregory, or Greg, uh, the one little girl uh, called Gig, and uh, or Giggy, and uh, and then I I had a crew cut at the time was sort of one of the styles, and so my big big oval shaped head uh, they started calling me Eggy, so uh, so I was Eggy or Egghead or. Uh, in my elementary school days. Gag, Eggy, or Egghead knew better to stay out of trouble. But it was one incident he confessed to his mother that forever stays in his mind. I guess the one thing that I remember, uh, we lived out in the country and I had a BB gun. And so, you know, you always were trying to to see how good you were at, with your aim and so on. And and uh, so the one day I figured, well, I figured I would probably miss because the BB guns weren't all that accurate. It, I was probably 100 yards away or whatever, but I took aim at a, a bird that was sitting on a branch and wound up hitting it and killing it, and I felt so bad about it. And my mother loved birds. She always was putting out, you know, bird feed for the birds to come, and, and so I felt so bad. Uh, and I, of course, told her, and I sat around and long face for the rest of the day there and i'm not sure if i ever i know i never shot anything else again maybe i'm not i guess i suppose i shot the bb gun at targets or something after that but that was that was certainly one thing that i remember dr forbes knew he loved science from the time he was young but what would he be doing if he had not gone into meteorology well i i knew i wanted to be a, a scientist uh and uh, I always had, a, had some interest in geology, so potentially I could have been a geologist as well. The uh, so that maybe would have been that maybe would have been a second choice. I did take some classes in geology. Severe weather doesn't have open and close hours. It's a twenty-four hour a day business, so free time is often found when storms stay away. Doctor Forbes says he has one hobby to keep him occupied. Uh, I uh, I tend to be a picker and a collector, so. My uh, my collecting a hobby at the moment is looking for autographed books, uh, you know, especially if they're sort of a somebody that you've heard of. So uh, I've got quite a quite a few autographed books at this point. During the off season, everyone needs a vacation. Doctor Forbes says it's a chance to see friends and family. In the winter and, uh, and to some extent, if. In the fall, if there's not tropical storms, I have uh, a l- little bit more free time, and so uh, usually in usually, usually in July, I uh, uh, go and join my cousin and his family at North Myrtle Beach for for uh, for some vacation. I plan to do that this year, and uh, friend and my cousin and a friend often come down uh, in uh, in August around my birthday time, and we take some day trips. Around in Georgia, and and then sometime in October or November, they sort of tend to come down, and, and we take them day trips. So, and then I usually go back to Pennsylvania for Christmas or or New Year's or sometime somewhere around that time. 
for some uh, you know, spending time with the family. Traveling can be a great time for relaxation, but what if you could travel in a time machine? Marty! You've got to come back with me! Where? Back to the future! We told Dr. Forbes he had two choices. He could travel forward in time to learn about the technology of weather, or go back in time to teach people things yet to be discovered. I certainly uh, would like to see in the future what changes have been made, for example, in terms of, uh, you know, are we able to use computers to predict tornado and give tornado warnings, predicting them instead of just uh, detecting them. That's sort of what the the plan is for 10 years or so from now, is to warn on forecasts rather than warning on detection uh, based on radar or sightings like we do now. So that would be exciting. And maybe, well, hopefully I'll live long enough to see that. see that happen. Things are advancing so fast now that that I'll probably live to, to see a lot of things. I know Dr. Fujita would have been so excited uh, to be able to see uh, the results of these mobile Doppler radars and, and uh, all of these cloud-resolving computers, storm-resolving computers that we have now. He'd he'd be so excited if he could have lived another, another decade or two to, to see all the advances that have taken place. For me, it would also be kind of fun to go back to the past. Uh, I spent some time in uh, in the Netherlands and in other countries, uh, but I was about a year total in the Netherlands, Holland, as we often call it, and uh, was fascinated by castles. I and I got a little bit of free time to travel around to France and Germany, and and uh, so I would always try to go and see these castles. So. One branch of my family tree that I've done a little bit of genealogy suggests that if if that link is correct, that would uh, actually have me related to some of the the uh, nobility, the kings and queens, and the families of of the Europe area. area. And so I think that maybe that's part of my fascination with castles. So I guess I'd like to go back to the Middle Ages and and see if. See if I was really involved in some of that. That, that, that. If I went back, it would probably be to, to look at that kind of thing. Time has been good to Dr. Greg Forbes. He's been at the Weather Channel since 1999. In May of 2014, it was announced he had colon cancer. The prognosis was good, and after treatments, Dr. Forbes posted on his Facebook page that they found no traces of cancer in his body, and he is in remission. We've learned a lot from a man so full of passion about weather and science. And even during the stormiest weather, many beautiful days are ahead. Next on Tornado Talk, outbreak in Ohio. The towns of Sandusky and Lorraine were devastated on June 28, 1924, a time when there were no cell phones and no sirens. What warning was there? Outbreak in Ohio on Tornado Talk. This has been Tornado Talk, powered by thestormreport.com.